chapter 1, verse 4. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, somebody say wait, for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need your help. We need you to come and to speak to each and every one of us, to instruct us, your plans, your purpose, to speak to us the things of the Father. It's like Jesus living on the inside because you are the Spirit of Jesus. So we have you on the inside guiding us, leading us, instructing us, and helping us along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. And so we've been on this five weeks, it looks like now, since Pentecost Sunday, talking about the Holy Spirit, His ministry in the earth. And uh, if you haven't been here all along, I recommend you get online. You can catch up on that. And, and we're really looking at the Holy Spirit's ministry. And, and I think as born-again believers that every one of us probably would want to be used by God. Am I right in saying that you want to be used? Is that anybody here this morning? All right. Do you want to see the gifts of God flow in your life? What do I mean? How many would like to see miracles? How many would like to see uh, ears open up? How many would like to have words of wisdom, word of knowledge? So, so when you're out in the workplace and going about your week that God gives you a specific word, you can pray for someone and they're like, how did you know that? I mean, we all want to be used that way. At least I believe this group of people does. And, but, the, but the truth is, I don't really think we can walk in the power of God until we realize the relationship we have with the person God himself. Holy Spirit enables us to be able to have a real growing relationship like you would have with any other person, but better. Somebody say better. This is God of all creation, as we've been exploring, is living on the inside of you. Now, we, we, we settled right up front that you do receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved. Uh, in fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says that you are sealed until the day of redemption. That's when our bodies are redeemed by the Holy Spirit when you're saved. But we found out going through the book of Acts and other supportive scriptures that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is separate. Um, you're saved immediately. No one can take that from you. But there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus told the disciples to wait for. And that's what we're talking about. And now he enables us as we embrace that truth. And if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Again, it's specific. If you've never prayed for that, we'll pray with you after service. Our prayer people will be here. Come on down front. They'll explain that to you because um, I want to get into some more relational things today. But, but I just want to put that out there that there is a baptism. It's separate. We've talked about that in the past in this very series. But you and I have got to realize that when you're in a relationship with someone, how many know the relationship goes a little smoother and a little bit further if you understand one another's aims? dislikes, likes. We even found out that we can quench the Holy Spirit in our lives by the way we talk, by the way we treat other people, uh, by the things we think on. So again, we're not losing our salvation. No one's taking your salvation, but you're not experiencing a relationship at the level God has planned for you. 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 14 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I mean, no, uh, the love of God is great. The grace of God is great, but the communion with God's Spirit is fellowship, partnership, intimacy. We talked about that last week, and then finally last week, I left you with this scripture, and I want to start here this morning, Matthew 15. This is the classic amplified version. It says, so for the sake of your tradition, the rules handed down by your forefathers, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the religious folk of his day, you've set aside the word of God, depriving it of force and authority and making it of no effect. Do you realize as a born-again believer, you and I have the power to make God's word ineffective and powerless in our lives? It says it right here. If we're only going through the motions, if it's only a tradition, if it's not something that's a vital, life-giving relationship, and that's really what the Holy Spirit, what he wants us to find out. Jesus said, you pretenders, hypocrites, admirably and truly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he, when he said this, these people draw near me with their words, or their mouths rather, and honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are far away from me. 
Uselessly do they worship me, for they teach his doctrines, the commands of men. And so when we just go through the motions, now there's nothing wrong with traditions. Traditions are good. How many know going to church is good? Being in a Bible study is good. Reading your Bible and praying every day is good. But he wants us to go beyond just a tradition. And here, here's a little test I think we can all do. Am I moving into relationship and the grace of God and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit working in me? Here's how we can tell. If I'm just going through traditions, I'm judgmental. I'm angry when people don't see it my way. It's like if somebody has a different belief system. How many know the world is messed up? Did anyone ever find that out? All right? Turn on TV for about 30 seconds and you'll see how messed up it is. And it's the same thing over and over and over, in case you haven't noticed that. But, but the, the bottom line is, in my life, do I have more peace, even with someone who doesn't believe like me, even with someone who has a different opinion than me? Or am I constantly wanting to prove that I'm right, that it's my way or the high? That is a sure sign. Let me, I'm just trying to help us. That's a sure sign you're locked into just traditions, and the Holy Spirit is not bringing life into you the way he wants to. I'm not saying you're not saved. Somebody said it this way. It's the best way I can say it. It's like we're saved but living like hell. Okay. On our way to heaven but living like hell. And a lot of Christians fall into that category. Many Christians are very little different, if at all, from the rest of the world in the grace. Oh, we all want grace. <laughs> but the test of whether we've received grace is what we give. And that's the relationship. Somebody say relationship. See, the Pharisees had allowed their tradition to take precedent over the Word of God. The Word of God is quick, it's sharp, it's more powerful than any two-edged sword discerning between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the Word of God is really good for us if used properly. If used legalistically, it becomes judgmental, like I've already described. In fact, what had happened is the Pharisees' traditions created a breach in their relationship with the Creator. Our traditions, even good traditions, going to church, got my 10 chapters read in the Bible today, check. Went through my prayer list, most of it selfish, check. Come on, I'm just trying to have fun with you, all right? Was a good person, didn't drink, didn't chew, didn't smoke, didn't run with those that do, check. Check. Christianity is not a list of rules and regulations. Christianity is a relationship with the creator of the universe who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, how many whosoever's in this room? How many whosoever's watching online? All right. That whosoever will believe on him would not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's for everybody. Somebody say everybody. And you know that you and I are the vehicle of the message of grace, but if grace is not working in me, and all I want to do is fight and prove I'm right, how many know the world don't want that? You don't need more of that on Facebook. Come on, somebody. There's enough fighting going on there. Why do we have to participate and prove that we're right? It's okay to have opinions, and we should. But when all we want to do is fight and tell people how wrong they are, that to me is a sure sign, I really believe, that I have the Spirit of God on this, is that we are just walking in traditions, and it's not giving life. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 3. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. Do you see that? That's you and me, all of us, born-again believers, are ministers of the new. Somebody say new. New covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but the Spirit. So it's not do this, don't do that. Of course, do this, don't do that it does have some good application. I may know it, it helps to be nice, like we already said. It helps, like, if you do this, this, and that, this will be the outcome. So there's good things in the Word of God, but it's not a list of regulations. But the Spirit, the old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, somebody say new, the Spirit gives life. And, and that's what I was just trying to describe to you. So we have this new covenant that you and I are now the messengers of, the ministers of, and it's a covenant of life. Say life. It's not rules and regular. People say, well, you're a Christian. What do you believe? Oh, I believe God loves everybody. But he, he loves you enough to help you out of your mess. And see, when you're walking in a relationship with God, you can help other people out of their mess. But if you're not out of your mess, Jesus said this, if the blind lead the blind, 
they both fall into the ditch. <laughs> Turn myself off. Say, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. See, God wants us to lead other people, but we have to see clearly before we can do that. And, and, and I really believe the reason that more people don't know the will of God is that they don't have this friendship with God that we're talking about. If you have a friendship, a partnership, as we found out, you're partners with God. Partners in business, only better than that. He wants to invite you into this thing and, and ask of him of things that you don't know, and he's going to show you these great things. Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah 31, both of them are good. He wants to show you things and show me things that we don't know. And there's dozens of scriptures that reference the mind, the will, and the emotions of God. Again, when you enter into a relationship with someone, when you want to nurture that relationship and have a healthy relationship, I often reference my relationship with my wife, Trish. She's watching in Rockford today. Say hi, Trish. Hi, Trish. Downstate with our daughter and grandson. They took him to the zoo yesterday in Grand Rapids. They had a great time. They went to Grand Haven. Uh, now they're in Rockford, coming back later on today. But you can really relate it to a good marriage or a good long-term relationship with anyone. How many know you want to know what that person thinks? You want to know how they think, why they think. I love the scripture that tells us in Psalms that the people of Israel saw the acts of God, but Moses knew why. All right? It's not enough to just see God move. I want to be like Moses and know why. And by reading God's word, you start to see how he thinks, what his will is. And even though it's specific to you and I for our journey, there are some things that really are the same for everybody. And that's what the Word of God is. It's a good foundation. So am I using the Word of God to build a foundation for my life, or am I using the Word of God to make myself look better to other people and then pointing fingers at everybody? Let's look at God's mind, Isaiah 55. We already read this. Imagine that. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God has thoughts. You can't have thoughts without a mind. God wants thoughts that he has to be understood by us, to help us with our situations, to live an overcoming life. Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of us know this scripture. It's a, it's a favorite. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So God wants to give us a future and a hope. But if you read here in Jeremiah 29, it says to seek him to draw near to him, to pray, have a relationship. You know, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden some 6,000 years ago, roughly, God shows up, Adam is hiding behind a fig leaf. I mean, know oh, fig leaves don't make, make good clothes, but they were doing their best. God came along and clothed them. But he come, out, come along and he says, Adam, where are you? See, God is always looking, wanting that relationship. But am I running from him? trying to do things in my own way, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, trying to prove that I'm a good little Christian, check, or am I wanting to learn more from him in a real life-giving relationship? Look at Romans 8, 27 here. It says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know that God knows everything? There is nothing that God has to learn. I want you to get that concept for just a moment. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and I, and God has never had just an occasional thought. Oh, I never thought of that before. God's not like that. You and I will be like, oh, I never saw that. God knows everything that ever was or ever will be or ever is all the time. We cannot understand that with our mind, but it says here that the Spirit of God makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. One of the spiritual gifts that I'll get into a little more next week is praying in other tongues. There's certain types of tongues. We looked at that a little bit at the beginning of the series five weeks ago. I'll get into a little more with the gifts next week. But just praying in tongues, just a prayer language. I'm not even talking about a public tongue that needs to be interpreted even though God will interpret as you pray in other tongues and you're praying. 
You are praying in agreement with the Holy Spirit, the God who created everything, who never had a oh my or oh me or I never thought of that moment. He knows everything that ever was, ever is, ever will be all the time. Nothing takes him by surprise. And even though we would all agree with that, when is the last time we really acknowledge that by faith, when we're facing something that's very difficult for us to understand and wrap our minds around, do we really allow ourselves to have the peace of God which supersedes or goes above understanding, or are we frustrated because our Christianity is just a form of traditions and we really aren't hearing God specifically for our lives? God has a will, and this is one of my favorite scriptures. If you've come here any number of times, you've probably heard me reference this. Psalm 105, 19, it says this about Joseph. It says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And so really, if you look at what, what the Bible's really saying there is, how many know the story of Joseph, the dreamer? He had a specific word from God that was going to come to pass, but how many know it didn't go the way he thought it would? Ends up in the dungeon, falsely accused, if you know the story, great story. But it says here that until his word, his specific, all right, his word for his life, prophetic word, if you will, just insert that. Until the prophetic word came to pass, the word of God, the foundation, tested him. So the word of God has to be our foundation. If we don't know the will of God, his mind, his will, his emotions, we will never hear him clearly for the prophetic word in our lives. And how many know a prophetic word can come through another person very often? A prophetic word can come to us as we're praying in the spirit. He'll start to speak to us. A prophetic word could come. You're reading a scripture, and I, I know we've probably all had this happen. The scripture doesn't even say anything, but out of that scripture, you got something. If somebody else looked at it, they're like, huh? Because the, the word of God, the Bible says, it's alive. It's breathing. It's breathing life into us. So a specific prophetic word that's particular to you, you need. But unless you have a foundation you will not stand the test. And this is why, you know, I'm a big one for reading the Word of God. And I'm not saying you got to read 10 or 20 chapters a day. If you like to read and you, and you get peace out of it, don't, don't read 10 chapters a day so you can say, there, I read more than all my friends. That's not what I'm talking about. If you like to read, there's times I'll just read the Word, and it's like, oh, I just chapter after chapter. Other times you get one scripture, you got to close the Bible, you're down on your face, you're crying. How many know what I'm talking about? So see, it, it, it's really, it's relationship, all right? It's okay to have plans, but you can't stick to those plans when God wants to do something different. So it needs to be a life-giving relationship for his will. Uh, and I'll just say this. I can hear God with you as a pastor, as a friend, but I cannot hear God for you. All right? I had someone just this week, they came to me, and, and sometimes God will give me a specific word and use me in a prophetic situation, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, or a prophecy, or whatever, you know, like he would use any of us. But if someone just comes to me, says, hey, this is what God's saying. I just had this, just this week, say, this is what I think God's saying. And I'm like, I am not sensing anything specific. But if that's what God's saying, then I would do this, this, and that, and continue to find out what God is saying. <laughs> so I, I can hear God with you, but not for you. So as a pastor, as a friend, I'm telling you, you cannot take your relationship with God lightly. And we do. I've met people that, well, I used to read my Bible more. I kind of fell off. Or people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit and have prayed in other tongues. I've met people say, well, I used to pray in the Spirit. Why did you used to do those things and you don't anymore? No wonder you don't know what God's saying. Why would we take the greatest relationship we will ever have this side of eternity and throughout eternity, why would we take it so lightly? It should be the number one, number one, thing in your life. Trish and I, as I mentioned, we work on our marriage. We connect. We favor one another. We've, we've, we've gone to um, marriage conferences and counseling and things just to strengthen our marriage, have people in our lives that we're accountable to, always trying to get better at communication. But, but I want you to realize something. She is not the most important relationship in my life nor am I the most important relationship in her life. Now, there was a time, and she would tell you if she was up here, where I was more important to her. She wouldn't say that, 
But I, she, she lived in my shadow, so to speak, so much and thought so highly of me as a person because of her own issues, all right, because she felt less of herself. And again, she would tell you all this if she was here. Where she put me in a place where my relationship and pleasing me and being good for me was more important to her than her relationship with God. You cannot allow any relationship in this world. And this is how, this is how so many people that are single mess up. All right? So if you're raising kids or if you're single or if you want to help them, you have got to make sure that your relationship is so solid. And I'll tell you, when you're, when you're dating someone, when you're falling in love, I get it. It's fun. It's, it's passionate. It's exciting. All right? It's romantic, I hope. If it's not, I don't know why you're pursuing that person, but it is. But when your emotions get all caught up, you've got to be grounded in the word. And I've said it before, you know, rather than looking for the right person, become the right person. And that goes beyond marriage. Maybe some of us are are divorced and want to remarry or we're divorced and we want to stay single. I don't, I don't know what, that, what your situation is, but whatever it is, why not take your time, even if you're in a great relationship, and make sure that your most important relationship is him. He lives on the inside of you. Why would I want to get up and some, I talk to people and say, hey, how's your prayer life? Eh. Eh? Jesus lives on the inside of you. How can your prayer life be, eh? And I'm going to tell you why. Because you're feeding the flesh too much, and you're watching too much constant negative news. That's why. It's the truth. Awful quiet in here. A few of us are laughing. I know you're laughing online. That's quiet online. But I want you to think about that for a moment. I mean, even a prayer every day, today I want to know you better than ever, God. And then really meaning it and taking time to hear him. And then not only connecting on a regular daily basis with an amount of time, whether it's 15 minutes, half an hour, two hours, whatever, whatever it is for you. But then taking that specific connection time into the rest of my day. Why would I not value that? You and I... Let me say this first, and then I'll say you and I. So many times I've heard people say, oh, if Jesus was just here, oh, it would be so different if Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, we already looked at it in previous sessions. He said, it's better for you that I go away. It wouldn't be better if Jesus was here. Because Jesus had flesh. You read the Gospels. Jesus spent time with some of the disciples more time than he did the other 12, the rest of the 12. He had three, he had one. He go do special things. It, 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 it's just like, you know, and can you imagine if I'm one of the disciples and all of a sudden Jesus walks up to John, my friend there, he walks up to John. He says, John, man, you've been getting some things. Let's go, let's go hang out together. And I'm kind of like, but I've been reading my Bible and I've been doing this, check, and I've been doing that, check. Now I'm jealous, not that Jesus wanted to make me jealous necessarily. He's jealous for me. He's jealous for you. We looked at that already. Ephesians chapter four, it says he's jealous for us. But now I am worried that Jesus likes John more. We don't have to deal with that because Jesus is not here. Jesus is in heaven. He's praying for you and I. Holy Spirit, who is one with him, is interceding for us. The question is, am I on board with that intercession in the will of God for my life? And, I, and you know, it, I'm not going to stand here and tell you it's easy, but it's pleasurable and it's grace-filled. Why is it not easy? Because you need to set aside time. You have to take this serious. And if you take it serious, I'm going to tell you the grace comes along and your relationship with Jesus, no matter what, no matter where you are. And listen, this is a warning for somebody. We can never say, oh, my, my, my relationship with Jesus this is fine, pastor. This is good for everybody else, but <laughs> we're good. No, you're not. Not with that attitude. Because right? so many times I've seen so many marriages, including my own at one time. I thought everything was fine, and no, it wasn't. You need to connect. Somebody say connect. Okay, three levels of relationships. I can tell you're liking that, so we're going to go on. We're going to move on. Uh, th- this, 
to kind of set it up here, Jesus has risen from the dead. The Bible says for about 40 days he's walking around Jerusalem, walking through walls, talking to people, just doing all kinds of cool stuff because that's what Jesus does. Hasn't gone on and ascended to be with the Father yet, but spends a little bit of time encouraging them, telling them again, like we, we open up to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, giving them some instructions, the disciples. And Thomas says, Thomas heard that Jesus is around, one of the disciples. He says, well, I'm I'm not going to believe unless I touch the scars. I'm not going to believe it at all. So Jesus shows up, and this is a conversation he's having with Thomas. And I, I love this, and I hope you get something out of this this morning. John 20, he says, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You can breeze over this. We've probably all read it. Maybe we've all claimed a little bit of a blessing there because it says those who have not seen but there is something so good in this. Jesus, I believe, is saying that you and I can be more blessed when we haven't seen him than those who walked for three and a half years with him. We have a greater blessing on the inside. If we would value that, the creator of all the universe, God living, because sometimes we'll say, oh, if I just could have lived like that, or we'll read something in the Old Testament and say, oh, man, look at David, or, oh, man, look at Gideon, or, or look at all these, these guys and these men and these women and, and, and Ruth and her faithfulness and, and Deborah and her, her victorious walk and all these different things. Oh, I just, you have it better. <laughs> you and I have it better never, ever before until the last 2,000 years has a man been able to have the Spirit of God living on the inside of him. That's, that's how important this is. And so, again, Jesus said, it's better that I go away. And let me ask you, is it possible? Is it possible that you and I have an advantage over the 12 disciples who lived with Jesus, ate with Jesus, fished with Jesus, Peter walked on the water with Jesus? Do you and I have it better? And the answer is yes. And then my question is, why do we take it lightly? Why do we take it lightly? Why do we, we, we stop reading our Bible? Why do we stop praying? Why do we let the spirit of offense rob us? I, I don't know, life, life can beat you up, spit you out once in a while. I know that. But you can't stay there. Regardless, and so many times we'll say, but it's this person and that person. And I understand that can be really rough, especially if it's a person you're close to. But you and I have got to stay connected with God. Because if we stay connected to God, you know what the Bible says? Romans chapter 8, it says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. My question is, am I connecting by the Spirit of God that cries out, Abba, Father? Romans chapter 8 starts out with, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who don't live according to the law, but live according to the Spirit. Then all things, you know, you, you cannot claim all things work together unless you're allowing the Spirit to make all things work together for your good, regardless of your circumstance changing at the pace you want to see it change. Does that make sense? And we got to live in this, this peace, this grace, this love, but we can only get it by valuing our relationship. If we're valuing other relationships, and how many know it's fun to connect, and it's summer, and we're taking vacations. Trisha and I are going to take a couple weeks off, and we should, you know, you might as well before there's another lockdown. That's how I look at it, right? So <laughs> I ain't prophesying that, but who knows, all right? But, you know, it's good, but, but if our life is all about connecting with other people, but we're not connecting first with him, and this has to be a real, we got to examine ourselves. Is he my greatest delight? If everything in my life was to change, would I still delight myself in the Lord? If he never answered any of the prayers that I'm believing him for, and he will answer them, but if he never did, am I content where I am? That's what Jesus taught. In fact, he said in Matthew 6, if you seek the kingdom of heaven first and his righteousness, you know that word means right standing, it means relationship. If you seek the kingdom of heaven first and that relationship, you won't lack anything. Because he said everyone in the world wants to get food, everybody wants to have clothes, everybody wants to have a place to live. How many know we all need those things? But he said you seek the kingdom of heaven first and all these things will be added. See, seek the kingdom of heaven and 
his righteousness. That's relationship. Our relationship with God answers every prayer. Okay, let's talk about relationships a little bit. We got a couple of minutes. Uh, probably three levels of relationship. One is the physical level. And I'll just relate this to a, um, a, a wedding, a marriage, if you will. Um, so you see somebody you like, boy, they're good looking. And, and they should be, okay? If you're going to spend the rest of your life with them, they should be good looking, even if it only lasts for a few years, because that's, you know. <laughs> no, now, Trish, after 32 years, she's more beautiful now than she was. I ain't so bad myself, but hey, okay. But <laughs> beauty fades. Come on, keep digging, yeah. Beauty fades. But it helps to at least look good for a few years, right? Okay. No, I mean, so, so that, that really, <laughs> the physical level, and, and you know, here's, here's, uh, here's what we'll fall into sometimes, too, is, is maybe we're, we're just meeting somebody, we like them, and then we... Say, well, we don't really connect on this or that or the other thing. And listen, we don't have to connect on everything. And whenever I spend time, I'm, I'm spending time with a couple of individuals right now um, that are wanting to get married and taking them through some counseling. And it, you can disagree and still agree to disagree and still have a great relationship. So I'm not saying that. But you have to do it properly. You can't just ignore it. So, so you have to feel, okay, well, you believe this, but I believe that. Let's talk about it. Well, sometimes in the courting phase, we'll just ignore that because we just want to get married. Because they look good to me. All right. Now, none of you would fall into that because you're all smarter than that. If you're watching online, you're smarter than that too. But everyone else that you know, you need to tell them this and warn them. All right. And so maybe common interests, whatever, we just don't. And we say, let's get married. They get married. Then down the road, they think, oh, boy, we better do something. And we better get our marriage to a deeper level of intimacy if we're going to survive. All right. And then we start to develop it. Well, develop it first. But the physical level... They look good. I can ignore some other things, but that's really the lowest level, if you will. And that's the level that the disciples had Jesus. Now, Jesus did some great things. Don't misunderstand me. He empowered them for periods of time. He breathed the Spirit on them. The Holy Spirit didn't live inside like he does now. We talked about some of that. So they saw some really cool stuff. But literally, they were connected with Jesus on really the lowest level of relationship. Because they didn't have the Spirit of God yet. I want you to get that. Jesus was connecting with them, but they just... Matter of fact, that's why Jesus in John 16, he said, I got a lot of things to tell you guys, but you, you can't bear it. <laughs> so I'm going to leave, and the Holy Spirit will tell you all these things. See, he, he, that's why Jesus talked this way, because that was the lowest level, it was physical. Then there's a soul or personality level, start to connect with someone. That's a good way to start a good relationship, long relationship, a marriage relationship. You want to connect in, in the soul intellect, if you will. First Samuel 18, it says, now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And so Jonathan and David had this great relationship where they, they loved one another as themselves. They looked out for each other. Everybody, you know, hopefully you get a friend like that. If you get a friend like that, nurture it, value it, because boy, if you have one friendship like that the rest of your life, even if you're not married at this point, or even in addition to your marriage, cherish it. I mean, so many times when we're young, we think that, oh, lots of friends, that's the life of the party, that's what we want. No, you want one or two good friendships for the rest of your life. That's what you need. Now, you can have a lot of relations, but I'm talking about a deep friendship that's going to benefit you. So this is the second level with our soul. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. This is by reading the word of God. We're getting the mind of God. We're starting to see how God thinks, all right? But then the Holy Spirit, which is the third level, the spiritual level, 1 Corinthians 2.11, for what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of God which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot know the true thoughts or motives of another person unless you are perfectly in tune with their spirit. And this is why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so important. This is why the relationship we have with him, Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God the Father, the Spirit of Jesus Christ the Son, in us, nurturing that, because you and I are literally connecting with God. In fact, let me, let me just throw this in. Maybe this will help us understand the advantage that I think we have. I'm trying to stir it up on the inside of you to value the relationship you have with God and not take it lightly. I hope that's what I'm doing. That is my desire. 
And so even, and I, I relate our relationship with God a lot like a, a marriage because the Bible says that in Christ, a marriage is a reflection of the church's relationship with Jesus because he's the groom, we're the bride. That's what the Bible says repeatedly. And so <clears throat> this is why the Bible teaches, New Testament included, it says that we should have sex after we're married, not before, not trying it out to see how it fits. That's the, that's the way the world does it. I get They just do. And, and so many Christians, we fall, and if you've fallen into that, there is no condemnation for those who are I'm not trying to condemn anyone, but I'm trying to set a principle. I want you to just hear this. So it says, wait, because, you know, that is just, that's, that is a physical level. Something spiritual does happen, but you should connect intellectually and spiritually first. And any marriage counselor, Christian, will tell you that's what you need to work on through your courting or whatever it is, is connecting emotionally and spiritually, and then the, the natural comes. And look at this is what God in all his wisdom has done. The disciples knew Jesus only in the physical with glimpses of the spirit. Does that make sense? The New Testament church baptized in the Holy Spirit. What God now does for us is allows us to get to know him intellectually and spiritually before we see him face to face and are united together with him in marriage, so to speak. It's an awesome, awesome thing. And so we have an advantage. Say, I have an advantage. So Paul is saying we can know the true composition, the deep matters of the heart of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So many times, Christians, we may be born again, but we are living by the spirit of the world. Our decisions, our doubts, our fears, our goals are all led or at least guided in some way by the spirit of the world, not the spirit of God. Most people... Not you, but the people who didn't come to church today. All right? <laughs> it's so true. And, th and that's why we really need to stop, rest, connect with God before we do anything rash. Because I may know the world and challenges in the world can cause you to want to do something rash sometimes. Right? Yeah. Anybody ever get irritated? You can't lie, you're in church. But what do I do with that irritation? I just take it to God. Say, okay, God, you're, you're bigger than this. I am not, I am not, I do not have to be right because he is. And if I'm right with him, guess what? I'm right. That is really what you and I, we need to learn to live out this way. And Christians say, well, I know, I know God. I'm a Christian. You can tell if someone knows God by the way they live consistently. Anyone can mess up. We all, we all do, Right? But the way someone lives consistently, I'm not talking about do this, don't do that, don't drink, don't chew, don't run with the... I'm not talking about you taking your little judgmentalism and measuring it up against somebody else. I'm talking about fruit. Somebody say fruit. And I said last week, I really believe God wants us to really understand the fruit of the Spirit before we start to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Because you need both. In fact, I believe the fruit of the Spirit sets us up to be able to release, God to release, the gifts of God's Spirit into other people's lives. And I'll get to that in a moment. But most, most Christians say, well, I know God. But you can tell they don't because their life is like everybody else's. Full of fear, full of doubt. And we can all have fear or doubt from time to time. But our, our, we don't have, where's our faith? What do we do with our finances? I talked a little bit about that last week, so I won't touch on that too much this service. <laughs> how, do I, how do I honor God with my money? First in the tithe and then after that. Or is it just my money and that's that? Well, if you live, it's your money and that's that, you're going to have a rude awakening when you get to heaven. and You got a little shack to live in. I mean, maybe that's not true, but maybe, it's, maybe it is true. But the Bible does say that the way we live our life is important, and it will, it will determine the rewards we get. All right? So what am I doing? Am I living a kingdom mentality in every area of my life, 
with the best of my ability, allowing God to do beyond my ability. For he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. But I have to commit and submit to that and allow him to do beyond what I can do. And that's what faith is. Again, Christians would say, well, I know God. Okay, let me just say this. This is not a political statement, so don't judge me. Probably everyone in this room, without fail, anyone watching online, most people in the United States, I would say, do you know the president? They say, well, yeah, Donald Trump. I'm not asking if you like him. I don't, I'm just making a point. Say, okay, do you know Donald? Yeah, I know Donald Trump. Well, you don't really know him. It's common knowledge. You know who he is. Most Christians have only common knowledge of God. They know who he is. Well, yeah, he created. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, Adam and Eve sinned, and now he judges us, and I better get it right or he's going to make sure I go to hell. That's what many people believe about God. In fact, a lot of Christians kind of live a life on this teeter-totter. They lose their salvation. Today God loves me. Today God doesn't love me. That is because we are not taking time to embrace this relationship I'm talking about. You and I have got to move beyond common knowledge so that the fruit of God's Spirit can start to work in us. I'm going to, um, two scriptures, and then I'm going to wrap it up for today. Um, and you got to remember this before I get there. Your spirit is made perfect in Christ. Hebrews 12, 23, it says that our spirits are perfect. Your spirit man, the real you, will never be any more perfect than it is right now. Your spirit man is in tune with God, but our flesh gets in the way because our body, our mind, our will, emotions are in the process of being saved, and our flesh, this container, will be saved either at the return of Jesus and the, the catching away or the resurrection of the dead, one or the other. So our spirits are perfect, saved. Our mind, brain is in the process of getting saved, and then our, our, our flesh will be saved. So you need to understand that. So that's how sometimes we may not sense God. That's why fasting is important. That's why setting time aside uh, when it maybe isn't convenient on a regular basis to connect with God. That's why it's important because your flesh is, and we've talked about it before. I know this isn't a fasting message, but that's your flesh, the Bible says, is at enmity with God. It's in constant conflict with God. So that's why it's important. So, um, oh my gosh, I, won't, I got further last service than I did this service, so I must have said something. Um, is it possible that you and I have an advantage? Is it possible that Paul, the apostle, had an advantage over the other disciples because he never walked with Jesus in the flesh. He had a vision. Jesus knocked him down and then told him to go to Ananias. Ananias laid hands on him, restored his sight, and he started serving God. But he never saw him in the flesh. So Paul the Apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament, had more insight. In fact, 2 Peter 3 Peter, the one who walked on water, walked with Jesus, one of Jesus' favorite three, said this about Paul. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist into their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So what's Peter saying? Peter's saying that Paul is writing things that are hard to understand. Here's Peter, walked on the water, lived with Jesus, said some of Paul's writings are hard to understand. He had more revelation than all of the other apostles did. And he did not walk with Jesus in the flesh. This is the advantage, I believe, that you and I have. But we need to allow the fruit of God's Spirit to start to work in us. Galatians 1.11 But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean we don't need teachers. We do need teachers, but the Holy Spirit comes alongside and bears witness of the things that were being taught by the Scripture. He's saying, look, you need a personal revelation, and when you have a personal revelation, then you and I start to walk in the gifts of God's Spirit. So, here's how we're going to end. Oh, gosh. I have to stop there. Um, I have John 15, I have verse 4 and verse 8 highlighted, but I'm going to read more than that. So I'm going to open my Bible here. I want to read more here because I think this is one of the most misunderstood 
And I want to encourage you. If you're not, if you're not where you, you should be in your relationship with God, you've made Jesus Christ your, sa- your Savior. He's not done with you. All right? He is not casting you away. He's not disappointed and, oh, I'm done. You're, you're finished. The devil wants you to believe that so you can stay in the state that you're in. But that is not the truth. With God, all things are possible, and he has a great future for you. So fruit. Somebody say fruit. John 15, many of us know it. Verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, it says, takes away. This is a very poor translation. All right? The translation should be, in most of your Bibles, if you're looking at a Bible, has a footnote, and it says lifts up. That's what it should say. And in fact, if you were to look at the way vine dressers would tend their vines, their grapes, in that time and still in parts of that world still, but back in the day that this was written, the disciples would have understood that what they do is, is uh, because of the dry desert. I mean, it's like a desert, much of, of Israel. I mean, some of it's very lush now, but they're still where this would have taken place, very dry where the grapes would grow grow. And what would happen is because of the Mediterranean breezes is that these grapevines would start to grow along the ground, but down on the ground, they would get mildewy and moldy. And so the vine dresser would come and lift them up. See, you're in him. Say in him. Jesus is saying, if you abide, see, we're abiding. He's not cutting you away. The word here is literally picking you up And really, pruning, if you look at pruning, it's almost like dusting you off. Yes, he prunes us, I get that. But he's picking you up and dusting you off so that you can produce more fruit. He's not done with you. You're in him. Abide in him and let his word abide in you. And you will bear the fruit of God's spirit. Let's read this, Galatians 5. 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, Peace, even when I don't get my way, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We love that one. There is no law against these. So, sounds just like you, right? There's, there's, it's how you, we all live our lives right there. This is what God wants to do to produce fruit in us, and I believe with all of my heart that the fruit of God's Spirit sets us up for him to be able to touch other people. We'll find out next week. The gifts of the Spirit, the Bible says, are given to us to benefit other people. The gifts of God's Spirit are to benefit other people. You may, and, and, and here's the thing. The fruit opens up the door for ministry. Psalm 37, it says, taste and see, or 32, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. You may be anointed with a gift of healing, and that there is such a thing. We'll look at it next week. But if you're mean and angry, who are you ever going to pray for? You say, well, I can pray for you. People are like, I don't want what you got, man. You got something all over you. They don't want that. If you are not living and allowing God to abide in you by the fruits of his spirit, you can have all the gifts flowing through you in the world. Oh, somebody might get healed here and there. So people say, well, I have the gift of healing, Pastor. Okay, well, let me see the fruit of God's spirit before we unleash you on people. It's the truth. It's the truth. And so many times we just want the power gifts, but we ignore the fruit. Jesus says, abide in me. Let him lift you up. Let him dust you off. Let him prepare you for ministry. In Jesus' name, amen? I, said, I thought we were going to do another song. I am sorry, worship team. You waited. I don't think we're going to. You're probably ready to give up on me, but... Lift me up, dust me off. Or no, maybe we will do one. What the heck? We can do one. Those who want to stay can. Come on. We need to learn how to live in God's love. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to put this on. I'm going to move over here. I'm going to pray on that mic right there. That's how I sound every morning when I get up. Let me, let, let me give you a little bit of homework. Do this. A little bit of homework. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Say 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter. 
it really is a good expression of the Spirit, the gifts of God's Spirit. And really, every gift, tenderness, gentleness, everything we just read, patience, all of it is rooted in love. If we are allowing the love of God to work on the inside of us, it's going to transfer our, uh, transform our lives. I want to pray that over you. Then we're going to sing this song, and it's good. Father, we thank you that the Spirit of God is working in us. I ask that you would start to do a work that we would take your ways upon us, that we would realize that you're gentle and lowly. You take the low spot. You come along, and your, your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. I just ask that you lift things off of us, Father, that you just take any performance in our lives and just we, just, we don't want to live like that anymore. We want to live in your love. We want to live in the power of your love because it is the greatest transforming thing ever. We love you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.